so uh, Lee Dudakin is a professor of biology and distinguished university scholar in the Department of Biology at the University of Louisville. He is a behavioral ecologist and historian of science, and his main area of research interest is the evolution of social behavior. Lee has spoken at more than 100 universities worldwide and has published more than 150 articles on evolution and behavior. He is a frequent contributor to Scientific American, Psychology Today, and The New Scientist, and has authored or co-authored numerous books, including Cooperation Among Animals, An Evolutionary Perspective, The Altruism Equation, Seven Scientists' Search for the Origins of Goodness, Mr. Jefferson and the Giant Moose, we're gonna hear about that today, and most recently, and we'll hear about this tomorrow, How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog, Visionary Scientists in a Siberian table of, table, Tale of Jumpstarted Evolution. Lee is also the author or co-author of two textbooks, Evolution, uh, co-authored with Carl Bertram, yes. um, and Principles of Animal Behavior, a pretty well-known textbook uh, in that field. I'm also going to read, if you don't mind, just very quickly, his uh, description of himself on Twitter, which I think is, is actually, uh -oh. I like better what than did I say? It's probably because we have some things in common. He describes himself as an evolutionary biologist, a writer, a New York Yankees fan, a Seinfeld fanatic, he has a serious case of wanderlust, and he is the curator of the world's finest Do Not Disturb sign collection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, and thanks, Brian, for uh, hosting me. And uh, as Brian said, we've known each other for a while on Facebook. We also share many f uh, friends and colleagues. And I've enjoyed my visit so far, getting a chance to see some labs, talking to some folks. Um, about their teaching and their research, and it's been fun. And as Brian mentioned, if you get the chance, come tomorrow for a talk that's completely different than today's talk. Tomorrow I'm going to talk to you about a book I wrote with um, a woman by the name of Ludmila Trut, who um, has led for the last 60 years the probably the most, one of the most important experiments ever done in, in uh, evolution and behavior where they have been domesticating foxes in Siberia. And I'm going to tell you about, um, about that in the book that Ludmilla and I wrote. So I'm going to start today, though, with this quote, which, as you can see, comes from JFK's opening comments at a 1962 dinner for Nobel prize winners. And of course, um, it's a fairly famous quote. I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent of human knowledge that has ever been gathered together at the White House with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined here alone. Um, and so when we hear this, everybody shakes their head up, up and down. Yes, everybody recognizes Jefferson um, as brilliant. Uh, the thing is, you know, when we think about his brilliance, we tend to think about it in the context of politics. And there's really every reason to do that. But if you actually read Jefferson's letters, what you see is that his heart was not truly in politics. Over and over again, he writes that he would like nothing more than to cast off the shackles of politics and do what he loves to do more than anything else, which is science of all different forms. In particular, he would constantly write that he just wanted to go up to Monticello and study natural history. He would often write to friends and colleagues things like, nature intended for me the tranquil pursuits of science, rendering them my supreme delight. Science is my passion. Politics is my duty. When Jefferson would travel around, he would carry little pieces of paper with him. And he would take notes on all sorts of natural history occurrences that he happened to come upon. He would note when the first flowers of this species were blooming, or when the frogs started chorusing down at this lake. And by the time he got to wherever he was going, his pockets would be overflowing with bits of information about natural history. He was a passionate, some might argue, obsessively fanatic natural historian. And what I'm going to do today is talk to you about this incredible argument that Jefferson got into with arguably the world's most famous scientist at the time, Count 
Buffon. Buffon was a beacon of the French Enlightenment. And when he discussed natural history, and we'll get into this in much more detail, he made the argument that all life in the New World, particularly in North America, was degenerate, weaker, feebler, and shriveled compared to life in the Old World. And Jefferson spent an inordinate amount of time trying to demonstrate to the world why Buffon was so mistaken about his claims. So to put this in some context, Buffon was an incredibly ambitious guy. He was a mathematician and he was a natural historian. By the time he was in his late 20s, he was already a well-established member of all the major scientific and mathematic societies in France. And then in the late 1760s, the plum scientific position in the world, which was the curator of the King's Natural History Cabinet. I'm sorry, this was in, being in about the late 1750s. The, the curator of the King's Natural History Cabinets, this position opened up. Buffon campaigned for it, and he got it. And he was about 40 years old at this time. And what Buffon decided he was going to do was first he was going to increase the sample size of the King's Cabinet of Natural History, and he was going to modernize it. But perhaps most importantly, he decided what he wanted to do was write the definitive encyclopedia of natural history. And for the rest of his life, for the next 50 years, he produced the encyclopedia called Natural History General and Particular. This came out from the late 1740s through 1788. Depending on how you count, 36 volumes, 6,000 pages of natural history with extraordinarily well-drawn illustrations, mapping out virtually everything that was known about natural history. This book was extraordinarily popular. It was the best-selling book before the year 1800 period across all books. It was the talk of the salons in Paris. It made Buffon the world's most famous scientist. And it was translated into a dozen languages, including eventually English. And it's in natural history general, general in particular that Buffon lays out these arguments that are going to so infuriate Jefferson and many of the other founders. The ideas quickly became known as the theory of new world degeneracy. So if you open up the encyclopedia today, and it's still, by the way, considered to be the, the definitive encyclopedia on natural history, across three volumes in about 200 of the 6,000 pages, you will see Buffon laying out this theory of new world degeneracy. And what Buffon argued was a series of things. First of all, he argued that animals that were found both in the New World and the Old World were smaller and feebler, degenerate in the New World, including America. That was his first claim. Second claim was that if you looked at animals that were only found in one of the two places, the animals that were found in the Old World were always larger than the animals that were found in the New World. So the first point is about when you find a given species in both places. The second is if you just look at all the species in the New World, on average, they're degenerate compared to the species in the Old World. Furthermore, Buffon claimed that not only were they degenerate here, but there were fewer species in the New World than the Old World. And finally, that if you were foolish enough to bring a species into the New World, 
and try and domesticate them, simply being here would cause them to degenerate compared to where, what they were when they were in the old world. And so we can ask, where does Buffon get the information that leads him to make these sweeping, damning claims about life over a very, very large area? Where does data come from? So like most natural historians of the time, he was what we might call today an armchair natural historian, which means that he was not going out and gathering data in the field. He was getting data from a number of different sources. First of all, there were already many different natural history encyclopedias, and Buffon tapped into those and he gave credit where credit was due. Another place that he got data was that he ran a little menagerie out at a summer palace he had on the outskirts of Paris. So people would bring from all over the world these exotic creatures, and Buffon would study them in the menagerie. Um, these, these animals included everything from a monkey named Jocko who went around setting fires to just about anything you could, that he could get his hands on. But the vast majority of the data that Buffon got about the New World came from travelers who had left France and gone over to the New World for one reason or another, typically to make money, spent some time there, and then came back and told Buffon what they had seen, which of course already is a very biased sample size, uh, very, very, very biased sample, and it's going to include all sorts of exaggerated claims. But this was the data that Buffon had to work with, and so that's what he used. Now, Buffon was a serious scientist. And he was highly regarded as a scientist. And so it wasn't enough for him to make these sweeping claims. He wanted a theory to explain why life in the new world was degenerate. And he thought he had one. There were two basic reasons, Buffon argued, that life over here was weaker, shriveled, and diminished. The first one was that the new world was, on average, colder than the old world, and that that temperature difference led to degeneration. It's questionable whether or not there was enough data for him to make that claim at that time, right? But in principle, it's not outrageous, at least in the late 1700s, to think that maybe, in fact, cold temperatures could lead to smaller, weaker animals. The other reason, and perhaps the more important reason Buffon thought all life over here was degenerate, was that the New World was way more humid than the Old World, and that this humidity led to degeneration. And again, we need to put this in the context of what was known at the time. So at this time, the leading theory for where disease came from was what was called the miasma theory. And the miasma theory proposed that disease came off of stagnant bodies of water in the vapors that came off those stagnant bodies. So again, it's not outrageous, if that's the leading theory for disease, to think that humidity might also lead to degeneration as well as the production of disease. If you look across these 200 pages, over and over again you see examples that Buffon trots out of life in the old world versus life in the new world. And the new world always comes up short. And you see these wonderful quotes. The new world, in these melancholy regions nature remains concealed under her old garments and never exhibits herself in fresh attire. Be there, being neither nourished nor cultivated by man, she never opens her fruitful and beneficent womb. But Buffon was not done yet. He argued, if humidity and cold lead to degeneration of the animals, then they will also lead 
to degeneration of the indigenous people. And so next, Buffon makes the argument that Native Americans are degenerate compared to human populations in the Old World. Keeping in mind, of course, that he had never been here, but he makes these claims, and he makes them in rather stark form. So here are just a few of the things that Buffon says about Native Americans and degeneracy. With respect to the Native American, he has no body hair, no beard, no ardor for the female, no vivacity, no activity of mind. He remains in a stupid repose on his limbs or couch for whole days. They have been refused the most precious spark of nature's fire. They have no ardor for women and, of course, no love for mankind. And perhaps in the most damning quote, their heart is frozen, their society cold, their empire cruel, and in Native Americans, which he refers to here as savages, the organs of generation themselves are small and feeble. What's more, Buffon not only claims that Native Americans are degenerate, but that it's partly their fault that everything else is degenerate. Because if you think about animals, well, what do they, I mean, what can they do? They, they, they're here, it's cold, it's humid, it's not their fault, they're, de they're degenerate. But Buffon argues that the Native Americans could have actually done something. They could have drained the swamps got rid of that standing water, got rid of the vapors and the humidity that caused degeneration and everything, but they didn't. As I said before, this was an extraordinarily popular encyclopedia. People talked about it over and over. And a number of people began to try and take the lead from Buffon and extend this theory of New World degeneracy. And I want to just briefly tell you about two of them. The first one is a fellow by the name of the Abbe Cornelius de Pau. So now we are in the late 1760s. And du Pau, uh, du Pau publishes this book called The Philosophical Researches on the Americas. And basically, it's a relatively short book, but it was very popular. And it was originally published in French, but then it was published in English later on. And if you open it up, basically, de Pau starts this way. Buffon was brilliant. His theory is right. His examples are right. But he was a bit of a coward because he did not take the next logical step in the argument, which was that if cold and humidity lead to degenerate animals, and if cold and humidity lead to degenerate indigenous people, then anyone who is foolish enough to bring their family over from the old world to the new world, they too and their descendants will degenerate here. De Paul argues the Europeans who pass into America degenerate as do the animals. The Creoles, that's people descended from Europeans and born in America, have never produced a single book as an example of the degeneracy that exists over here. This degradation of humanity must be imputed to the noxious vapors from standing waters and uncultivated grounds. So now the argument is extended to Europeans who bring who come over here with their families and live here. A couple of years later, another fellow by the name of the Abbe Renal chimes in, and he writes an eight-volume set of books called The Philosophical and Political History of the Settlements and Trade of the Europeans in the East and West Indies, where again, he is going to bring up Buffon's theory of New World Degeneracy. He's going to praise Buffon for this, and he, like de Paul, is going to extend the argument to not just indigenous people, 
But anyone who lives there, here, including people who come over from other parts of the world, and in philosophical and political history, Raynal pens what is arguably the most inflammatory of all the statements that were made with regard to the theory of new world degeneracy and the quote that perhaps incensed Jefferson more than anything else that had been written so far. Raynal makes the argument that one should not be surprised that America has yet to produce a good poet, a clever mathematician, a genius in, one, in even one art or science. What's more, he actually sponsors an essay contest. And the question in the essay contest is, was it a good idea that anybody tried to colonize America and the New World? And the verdict was half the people wrote essays saying yes, and half the people wrote essays saying it would have been better off if nobody had done that. So as you might imagine, when these arguments made their way over to America, people were not happy. And Jefferson took the lead in trying to show the world why Buffon and his accolades were so mistaken. But he wasn't the only one. So before I get to Jefferson, I just want to show you that there were other founders who were involved, not nearly to the extent of Jefferson, but enough to demonstrate that this was something that people were talking about, and this was something that people were thinking about, and this was something that people were writing about, and it was certainly something that people were upset about. And so we'll do a quick discussion here of Madison, Hamilton, and Franklin, and how they weighed in very quickly. So Madison was Jefferson's buddy. Um, his protege at one point, and they exchanged hundreds and hundreds of letters. And most of them were about what you would think, which is, you know, forming a, a new kind of a government. But they talked about everything because they were friends. And there's this one wonderful letter where for about three pages, three pages or so, Ma uh, Madison is going on and on about sort of constitutional issues and that sort of thing. And then he just stops and he tells Jefferson, by the way, you should know that I have been measuring the, the length of the sexual organs of the weasels that are running around my house. And they in no way come up short compared to weasels in Europe. And you should feel free to use this in your arguments against Buffon. <coughs> Alexander Hamilton also weighed in on the theory of New World degeneracy. Hamilton did many, many things. Perhaps the one that he's most famous for is that he was um, the lead author on most of the Federalist Papers. Okay. And in Federalist number 11, there's this bizarre section that makes absolutely no sense unless you understand how upset people were about the theory of new world degeneracy. So most of Federalist 11 and most of the Federalist papers are sort of economic arguments about why we should form a Federalist government. In the middle of Federalist number 11, right, here's what it says. Here's what Hamilton writes. Men admired as profound philosophers have in direct terms attributed to European inhabitants a physical superiority. They have gravely asserted that all animals and with them the human species degenerate in America, that even dogs cease to bark after having breathed a while in our atmosphere. Now what on earth is that doing in Federalist number 11? It's there because Hamilton is worried that if people buy the argument about degeneracy, why would anybody do business with us? Why would anybody send money over here? Hamilton responds in Federalist Number 11. He calls this arrogant pretensions and, uh, and claims that it belongs to us to vindicate the honor of the human race and to teach that assuming brother, that is Europe, moderation on this point. Finally, 
Ben Franklin. So Franklin spent very long periods of time over in Europe, particularly in France, and most of that time he was entertaining himself at dinner parties. And of course he was sort of known as the quintessential frontier American and he loved that role. So one time he's at one of these dinner parties and who happens to be there except the Abbe Renal who said that one should not be surprised that America has yet to produce a poet, a mathematician, a, a clever person, a, an artist, or a scientist. So Franklin says to Renal, let's just settle this right now. And he tells everybody, okay, I want all of the Frenchmen to stand up and line up on one side of the table, and I want all of the Americans to line up on the other side of the table. And in his journal, he claims that he said, in fact, there was not one American present who could not have tossed out of the windows any one or perhaps two of the rest of the company. Not degenerate, we could toss them out of the windows. Now, of course, this was Franklin in his frontier logic form, and people loved it. But again, it demonstrates just how important this was to Americans to show the world how misguided Buffon was. But as I say, Jefferson is the person who took the helm in the attempt to debunk Buffon's theory of New World degeneracy. And so the rest of the talk is going to be about Jefferson and what role he played. And we'll basically look at two questions. First of all, why did Jefferson care about this so much? And then what did he do about it? Okay. So why did he care about it? Well, one reason is that, as I've said, he was a passionate natural historian. He wrote his daughter, there's not a sprig of grass that shoots uninteresting to me. And he was infuriated that Buffon, who, he, who Jefferson respected as a brilliant scientist, he was infuriated that on this point, Buffon would use natural history to try and damn an entire continent. So Jefferson, the natural historian, was very upset. Jefferson, the empiricist, was very upset as well. Besides the fact that, in principle, Buffon should not be using natural history to make political claims and damning, sweeping comments about an entire continent. But in fact, even if you grant him that he sh he's allowed to do that, he's wrong. We'll get into this in a bit more later, but Jefferson writes, it does not appear to me that Buffon or de Abitain, who did the drawings, have measured, weighed, or seen any of the animals in America themselves, which was right. They hadn't. They got the information from travelers. And Jefferson writes, who were these travelers? Was natural history the object of their travels? Never, virtu virtually never. Did they measure or weigh the animals they spoke of? No, they didn't. Or did they not judge them did, or did they not judge of them by sight or perhaps even from report only? Yeah, that's what they did. Right? And so empirically, he thought the data was weak at best. Jefferson, the literary critic, was also very upset about this because Buffon was not only regarded as the leading natural historian of the times, he was regarded as one of the best authors of the day. People today in English classes still use Buffon write, Buffon's writings as, as an example of brilliant rhetoric. And, you know, if you think about it, it had a 36 volume natural history encyclopedia that ended up being a bestseller almost had to be written really well because it's a pretty dry subject otherwise. Jefferson was afraid that Buffon was such a good writer that he would pull the wool over the eyes of his readers and just by his rhetorical skills convince them that the theory of new world degeneracy was right, independent of whether it was or not. And so Jefferson wrote, there has been more eloquence than sound reasoning displayed in, this, in support of this theory. And he wrote that it was Buffon's glowing pen 
not the logic of the argument that was swaying people. And finally, like Hamilton, Jefferson the economist was worried. He was worried because he and Hamilton and everybody knew that the only way America was going to survive in the early years was if we could establish trade with places overseas, Europe, Asia, and so on. If people thought Buffon's ideas were right, if this was a degenerate backwater, why would you come over here? And what, particularly, why would people who have money come over here? And he had good cause to be worried. Even though Jefferson didn't know it at the time, exactly what he and Hamilton were worried about was playing out over in Europe. Frederick, the King of Prussia, had recently started a new bureau of the government whose sole purpose was to convince people not to pack up and take their money and go over to the new world. And who does he hire to lead that bureau except the Abbe de Paul, who was the person who extended Buffon's theories to include anyone who was foolish enough to go over to the new world. This is exactly what Jefferson and Hamilton were worried about, and it was playing out in real time. OK, so he clearly has lots of reasons why he's upset. So what does he do? Right, well, the first thing he does is the first thing he does about anything that he's interested in, which is that he writes about it. Now, Jefferson wrote thousands of letters. But unlike some of the other founders, for example, uh, John Adams, he did not write books, except really one, called The Notes on the State of Virginia. This was an extraordinarily popular book. Not only was it translated in Fran into French, but historians of the era claim that before the Civil War, this, more copies of this book were sold in the United States than any other book. And it's in Notes on the State of Virginia that Jefferson takes on Buffon. Now, when we think of Jefferson the writer, we tend to think of things like the Declaration of Independence, arguably the most beautifully written political document ever. Notes on the state of Virginia is hideously boring to read. Hideously. And it's not Jefferson's fault. So here's what had happened. People had asked him a series of questions because they wanted to learn about Virginia, particularly foreigners. And he was one of the leading experts on Virginia. So he wrote chapters on such topics as the boundaries of Virginia. I mean, you know, you can only be so interesting in your writing when you're writing about boundaries and rivers and seaports. But right, if we go down here to chapter six, productions, mineral, vegetable, and animal, this is where Jefferson takes on Buffon's theory of new world degeneracy. And before we look at how, I want you to take a second and think about this. This is the longest chapter in the book, which means that the longest chapter in the only book that Thomas Jefferson ever wrote was devoted to debunking Buffon's theory. That's how important it was to him. And the way that he did it was primarily through a series of tables full of data. So here's the first table. And this is a comparative view of the quadrupeds of Europe and of America. And we're looking at aboriginals of both. So this is going to be a table that addresses Buffon's claim that if you find the same species in both places, it's always weaker and feebler and degenerate in the New World. But take a look at what's happened to the argument. The argument is general. It's about the new world versus the old world. But all people really cared about was America versus Europe. And so the whole table that Buffon, Jefferson generates here is making comparisons about the same species found in both places. Now, we should keep in mind that Jefferson's data is far from unbiased. I mean, he gathered this data from people that he told, look, I'm trying to show the world how misguided Buffon was. Right, so this is not unbiased data. Okay, but nonetheless, 
he was able to gather some data on species that you find in both places, which I've highlighted here. And Jefferson writes as a summary, the first table impeaches the first member of the assertion that of animals common to both countries, Ameri the, the Americans are smallest. Right? Actually, if you do the math, it turns out that not only does it impeach Buffon's first claim, it's actually in the opposite direction. The average size of the animals are larger in America. But Jefferson doesn't say they're larger. He just takes the conservative scientific approach and says they're not smaller, because that's what, Jeff that's what Buffon's argument was. So next, Jefferson takes on Buffon's claim that if you only look at animals that are found in one of the two places, the ones found only in America are going to be weaker and shriveler, shriveled and diminished. And again, his data do not show that to be true at all. What's more, this table that he creates goes on for a second page. And the only reason it goes on for a second page is the list of species found only in America keeps going on. So this is not only a counter to Buffon's claim that if you find th things only in one place, they're smaller in America. It does counter that. It also counters the claim that there are fewer species in the New World, which is Buffon's third claim. Let's hold on to the end for questions, and then we can do that, OK? Next, Jefferson takes on Buffon's argument that not only are animals degenerate, but the indigenous people are. And I said that notes on the state of Virginia is really boring. The one place it isn't is when Jefferson discusses this. Now, Jefferson was, I mean, if you read Joseph Ellis, Ellis's book on Jefferson, it's called The American Sphinx. And that's because Jefferson could hold multiple views on the same topic at the same time. And so his record with respect to Native Americans is not necessarily great. But he did respect Native Americans at a very basic level. And to counter Buffon's argument that the indigenous people were degenerate, Jefferson writes page after page about this person right here, Chief Logan, who was a chief of the Mingo tribe. What had happened is Logan's family and many others of his tribe were actually massacred by a bunch of white settlers. And in response, Logan went to the governor of Virginia and made this beautiful, impassioned plea for his people and the white people to live together in peace. Everybody knew this. It was published in the newspapers. And Jefferson argues that Logan's speech alone disproves Buffon's theory, that it is on par with the finest speeches made by Greek philosophers. There is no higher praise that you can get from Thomas Jefferson than that. And he continues to make other arguments about why it's mistaken. But Logan is the key one for him. Now, Jefferson understood that no matter how much space he spent in this book, the arguments were fairly dry. They revolved around long tables for the most part. There's some nice rhetoric on Logan, but mostly it's a pretty dry argument. And he knew that to convince people, he really needed to tap into the power of the physical. And so he decides that what he needs is a giant moose, about 7 to 10 feet tall, that he can send over to Buffon to show him once and for all that life here was vigorous and large, not degenerate, shriveled, and weak. And Jefferson obsesses over getting this moose to send to Buffon. So he starts off in the late, mid to late 1770s on the quest 
for the perfect moose. And so what he does is he starts writing all of his friends in, for information about the moose. I mean, he wants to know about the moose so he can make this argument in the strongest possible term, terms. So here's a letter. You can pull all of Jefferson's letters down um, in their original form and in transcribed form, form from the Library of Congress. Here's one that says, he's asking his colleagues, well, what's the height of the moose? Are, are they a swift animal? Have, have they ever been tamed? Tell me about the moose. I need to know about the moose. At points, it almost got bizarrely humorous, his quest for information about the moose. So he's sending this to many, many people. And they're sending him information back. And so one time, someone sent them something back, and, and, and Jefferson didn't reply. And this person was concerned, because everybody wanted to be in Jefferson's good graces. So what happened is this. this at this time, Jefferson was governor of the state of Virginia from 1778 to 1779. And the way it ended was not particularly good for Jefferson. Basically, the British invaded Virginia, and he escaped from the governor's mansion by about an hour. He was an hour away from being captured, and there was people who accused him of being a coward and all that. But nevertheless, he runs away from the British, which was probably a reasonable thing for him to do. And so he gets this letter that says, Sir, I, I, I sent you the information about the moose, um, but I haven't heard back from you. And he said, I'm sorry. The British invaded Virginia. I had to leave the governor's mansion for a while. I got the moose information. Thank you very much. And on and on and on. Now, eventually, the hunt for the giant moose settled um, primarily on the shoulders of one person, whose name was John Sullivan. Sullivan. Today, if you read about Sullivan, you'll read about him because he was one of the major, he was a major figure in the Revolutionary Army. He was a general. Later on, he became president, today what we would call the governor of the state of New Hampshire. But for our purposes, he was Jefferson's main go-to guy to get him a moose. And Sullivan was really happy to have this task assigned to him from Jefferson. And at first, he begins to send Jefferson these sort of teasing notes. So in one, he writes Jefferson, there's a moose's horn in one of the Native American towns that's so large that it's used for a cradle to rock children in. There are these giant moose out there. I haven't seen this one. I don't have one yet. But the fact that there's a cradle that big, that's a good sign. That means there's a moose out there that we can get that's big enough for what you want. Jefferson's very excited about this. And he starts writing, imploring Sullivan to find the perfect moose, to debunk Buffon. Here's an example of how passionate Jefferson is about this. Here's what he writes to Sullivan. The readiness with which you undertook to endeavor to get for me the skin, the skeleton, and the horns of the moose emboldens me to renew my application to you for those objects, which would be an acquisition here more precious than you can imagine. This is someone who wrote the Declaration of Independence, who's at the center of forming a new type of government, and he's telling Sullivan that the most precious thing that he could get from anybody is this moose. And Sullivan's looking and other people are looking, but it's taking time, right? They have other things to do as well. And it, it, the years are going by, and nobody is finding the perfect moose for him yet. And a few years later, in 1785, Jefferson is chosen as a replacement minister to France. So he sails over, and maybe it's actually not so bad that he hasn't gotten his hands on the perfect moose yet. Because if he had gotten it before, he could have shipped over the bones to Buffon, but somebody else would have had to give it to him. Now, if Sullivan can get him a moose, then Jefferson can reconstruct it, right, and bring it to Buffon and hand it to him in person. So he's sort of excited about this possibility. Eventually, 
Jefferson gets invited to Buffon's summer palace for a meal, which was a very, very hard invitation to get. This is a fellow, Buffon, by this time, who has the stature of Voltaire. I mean, he is the leading thinker, and he doesn't just issue invitations. Finally, Jefferson gets an invitation to Buffon's summer palace, and as was his wont, he went on and on and on to Buffon about how misguided he was with his theory of new world degeneracy. Jefferson tells Buffon, the European reindeer could walk under the belly of our moose. That's how big our moose is. But Buffon just wants to have a nice meal and talk about pleasant things. He doesn't want to talk about the theory of new world degeneracy. But Jefferson goes on and on and on. And finally, Buffon turns to him and says, if Jefferson can pr procure such a specimen for him, the giant moose, Buffon would, quote unquote, give up the question. Jefferson took that to mean that if he could provide Buffon with this giant moose, that Buffon would retract the theory of new world degeneracy. So if you thought he was obsessed with getting his hands on a moose before, it was nothing compared to the, what he was thinking now. Shortly after this, he gets the letter that he has been hoping for. John Sullivan has found the perfect moose. But Sullivan wants him to know this was no easy task. And he tells Jefferson, you need to realize that I hired a team of a dozen men whose sole purpose was to go out into the New Hampshire winter and find you the perfect moose. They found it. They dragged it 20 miles through the snow back to my house. Once it got back to my house, Sullivan writes, every engine was set at work to preserve the bones and cleanse them from the remaining flesh, to preserve the skin with the hair on, with the hoofs and bones and legs and thighs and skin without putrefaction, the skin of the head being whole and well-dressed, it may be drawn on at pleasure. The reason he goes into all the details about preserving the skin with the hair on, the hooves and the bones as it is, it's because Jefferson, the obsessive compulsive natural historian, had laid out exactly each one of these things that needed to be done. And Sullivan is saying, we did them all. But, he tells Jefferson, there's just one little problem. Right? When they drag the moose back through the 20 miles of snow, the antlers were destroyed. But fear not, Sullivan says, here's another pair of very large antlers. Just put it on this specimen and nobody will know the difference. And Sullivan tells Jefferson, I've hired a captain. We've crated up the moose, reconstructed it, crated it up. We're sailing it over to you in Paris and you can use it for your arguments against Buffon. So Jefferson is ecstatic. Now, keep in mind that, you know, some letters took a few weeks to get from the United States to Paris, and some took three months. And so there was often this lag between information, and sometimes letters that were written way later arrived earlier, and so on. Jefferson gets this letter, he's very excited. A couple of weeks later, Sullivan writes him, and says, I have some bad news. We don't know how, but the captain has apparently misplaced the crate with the moose in it. And Jefferson is distraught beyond words. Well, not really beyond words, because he turns around and he writes to Sullivan in his despair. He tells Sullivan, I know that you have put yourself to an infinitude of trouble more than I meant. And it definitely was not more than the infinitude of trouble that he meant Sullivan to go through. He says, Sullivan did it cheerfully. He didn't. And I feel myself really under obligations to him. That's true. That the tragedy might not want a proper catastrophe. 
the box, the bones, and all are lost, so that this chapter of natural history will still remain a blank. Every time I read that, I get sad. But I've written to Sullivan not to send me another. He's already gone through enough, and this chapter of natural history is going to remain a blank. Jefferson could have saved himself a tremendous amount of grief because a couple of weeks later, a letter came that said, we found the moose crate. I've got another captain who's sailing it over to you, and it will be there soon. The moose arrives. Jefferson gets it. And he sends it over and asks Buffon that the moose be placed on his legs in the king's cabinet. Jefferson writes in his diary that the skin and the skeleton convinced Mr. convinced Mr. Buffon, and he promised in his next volume to set things right. He interpreted Buffon's response as Buffon would now retract the theory of the new world of new world degeneracy in the next volume. Because remember, this is a 36 volume that's that's going, there's constantly new volumes coming out, even 40 years later. The problem is there is no next volume because six months later Buffon is dead. If you open up natural history general in particular today, you'll see these arguments just the same way you would have in the 1770s. Now it is true that Jefferson knew, that Buffon knew that Jefferson was right. And that did give him some solace, but he was afraid that this theory of new world degeneracy, that its tentacles would spread out in very unpredictable ways and they would be dangerous. And he was right. The theory went on for a good hundred years. And what happened was there were basically two camps that formed. One was primarily the American camp that said that Buffon, that Jefferson's moose and his arguments in the notes, notes on the state of Virginia had shown just how misguided Buffon was. And then there was sort of more European dominated school that said moose or no moose doesn't make any difference. Buffon's theories are just as right as they were when he proposed them. I just want to give you a couple of examples about the way that this played out. For the, and then we'll be done in less than five minutes. So this is now after Buffon is dead. This fellow, Jedediah Morse, was Samuel Morse of Morse Code, his son. But he was also, in the late 1770s, um, one of the leading educators in America. And he, in fact, wrote the primary textbook on geography and the primary textbook on history that was read in the first one-room schoolhouses in America. And if you open up these books, what you'll see immediately in the first pages, Morse says something akin to this. Young minds, you are going to see this nonsense coming out of Europe that life over here is degenerate, that it's weak and shriveled and diminished. Don't believe it for a minute. This was the first things that kids were reading in history and geography books. This is how important it was to people of that time for, 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 their, for children and the next generation to understand how wrong Buffon was. This argument, and I'm, I'm going to focus primarily on the American side of this here, to show you that not only was it in the school books, but this was something people were writing about in novels and in newspaper articles and in satires in every way that you can imagine. I want to give you one example here, and this is my favorite one. So this fellow, Joel Barlow, um, was famous for lots of reasons, but he was one of a group called the Hartford Wits. And he wrote these wonderful, long, satirical pieces. And I want to give you a quote from one of them where he's going to poke fun and attack Buffon's theory of new world degeneracy. And before I put the quote up, just keep in mind again that DePauw is the guy who extended Buffon's theory to anyone who was foolish enough to come over here. So here's the way that um, Barlow sets it up. He sets it up 
that people are looking, and on America, people in Europe are looking through this giant telescope over at America. And this is what is in his poem, The Anarchied. See vegetation, man and bird and beast, just by the distant squares in size decreased. What he claims is that they were looking through their telescope, but they had it backwards. So when they looked through it, everything looked much smaller than it was. Huge mammoth dwindled to a mouse's size. Colombian turkeys turned to European flies. Exotic birds and foreign beasts grow small. And man, the lordliest, shrink to least of all. There, through these inverted optics, show all nature lessening to the sage Dupas. Over and over again, you see this. You see Washington Irving writing about this. You see Alexander Humboldt writing about this. You see Kant writing about it. You see um, Keats writing about it. Everybody is talking about this for 100 years. So Jefferson was right. This argument stuck around. And it obsessed many of the leading minds of the day. Eventually, it disappears. By the 1850s, it's all but gone from history. People aren't talking about it anymore. They're not writing about it anymore. But remember, that is more than just about 100 years after the argument was first posed by Buffon, and a good 65 years after Buffon is dead. That's how long it stuck around. And everybody was talking about it. Now, it's always hard to say why an idea disappears. There are probably a couple of reasons that degeneracy eventually, the argument eventually faded. The first one is that the most interesting protagonists, people like Jefferson and Buffon, were long dead. The second one is that by this time, natural history in America was a well-established field of study. And People had shown without question that life here was not degenerate compared to life in the old world. It's interesting to note that many of the leading natural historians of the day, and I could list a dozen people here, almost every one of them wrote in their letters and journals that the reason that they got into studying natural history and gathering data was in part to debunk the theory of new world degeneracy. But the data clearly showed it was wrong. And lastly, you know, by the 1850s, good or bad, America was on an economic, economic juggernaut that demonstrated to the world that this was not a degenerate backwater. But again, for 100 years, this idea that life in America was shriveled, weak, and diminished was the talk of the continents. And I appreciate you giving me the time to tell you the story, to bring that story back to life, and for you to think a little bit about what all of this might mean in today's climate. Thank you very much.